Hello and welcome back to Curiosity Mine. I'm not in my usual location at the moment, but that is the Barwon River currently at moderate flood level. It's all very exciting unless you want to travel anywhere or do anything. But anyway, welcome back to Bush Botany where we meet up with Warwick Schofield to look around Lightning Ridge at some of the plants and trees on the opal fields, their unusual characteristics and their interactions with opal mining and with the opal industry. But first, we're going to look at this. This is the Golden Wattle or Acacia Pycnantha. It's Australia's national floral emblem and it's a pretty recognisable plant across the southern part of the country. But in the northern states, slightly different species of acacia are more common and that's kind of what this series of videos sets out to demonstrate. Most of the population of Australia lives around the edges of the country, mostly on the eastern side and mostly in cities. So when we think of Australian flora, we tend to concentrate on the plants that grow in the areas where people live, the things that you see every day. But once we move further north and further inland where the population becomes sparse and the average rainfall starts to decline into the semi-arid areas and into the outback parts of Australia, the types of plants that we see change pretty radically. The area around Lightning Ridge, which isn't even close to the extreme of the outback, sees maybe 400 millimetres of rain per year. It has a very shallow and infertile soil and as a result the trees and plants are very different to the lush greenery that you see in the coastal parts of Australia. Plants near Lightning Ridge are usually shorter, they have dark flaky bark, pale leaves that point downwards and they tend to be opportunistic when it comes to reproduction. We'll talk about that a bit later on. So today we're visiting a few examples of different species of acacia native to the Lightning Ridge area to have a look at their similarities, their differences and their methods of adaptation to the dry climate. Okay, so we have the Victoria wattle here, sometimes known as prickly wattle. The reason it's called that is it is quite prickly. It has those same small blue-green leaves, and look, it's finished flowering, but look at the fruits of it, like little pea pods still. So they're the fruiting bodies, and these can be grown, these, if you take these home and, and uh, put them on a moist growing bed, you will strike new little seedlings of the Victoria wattle. It grows in a whole belt right across the highway here in Lightning Ridge and in, in the flowering season uh, they are very obvious. They can be seen all the way. Bright yellow flowers, typical wattle, Acacia Victoria. But when they're not flowering, that's just a green bush and it looks the same as everything else around here. So that's why we need to keep our eye in. It's got this characteristic straight, dark, darky looking trunk. And, uh, but when you look closely, you'll find the prickles. And then when the yellow flowers come out, it's a spectacular local native tree. So uh, this is the weeping myall, sometimes called the boree. It's another wattle, Acacia pendula. There's probably over a thousand wattles in Australia and many of them are around here and we'll see some of them later on. But you can see the pendula name is from these drooping, small, bluey green leaves. Uh, and it's a very common local wattle, the weeping myall, the dark trunk, the bark. And look, here's some of the flowers. But the plants and animals here are what we call opportunistic when it comes to their breeding cycle. Normally we have on the coast spring, summer, autumn, winter. Out here it can be hot and dry for years in a row and nothing happens. And then we get the right temperature, the right moisture and the shingleback lizards come out and the trees start to flower and the birds have their nests and you can't always be certain what time of year. So here when we'd normally expect a wattle on the 1st of August, here we are uh, early in the year and it's decided to put out its flowers. It will put out little pods when they're finished and we're going to look at some other wattles, but I don't think we'll find them in flower like we have this one. So there's a spot of luck. Look at that. There's, there's the pod of the weeping mile with some flowers. And we'll see some little seeds inside it. Look that the ants and spiders have got to it. So there's your weeping mile, Acacia pendula. The first time I saw pictures of this plant I, in a book, I thought they'd put the photo upside down because I was used to plants growing upright. But here it is growing down. And you know, when I look over there at that tree, look at its leaves, nothing to do with wattle, and its leaves just look the same, and they're all pointing straight down, and that's a wilga. We'll talk about wilga later on. Leaves pointing straight down. 
So you'll hear that we use the word leaf or leaves quite a bit in this video, which probably seems perfectly normal because we're talking about plants, but it's actually worth mentioning that some acacia or wattle species actually have structures called cladodes in place of normal leaves. The word cladode comes from the ancient Greek klados, which means a branch, and a cladode is a modified branch or stem that serves some of the functions of a leaf and some of the functions of a branch. So in the case of acacia, the cladode is actually this big chunky part here that looks like a leaf, but it's actually a swollen leaf stem that's impersonating a leaf. And then coming from the end of that are these little feathery bits that split into two individual leaflets, one on each side. So those are leaves or leaflets, and that thing that looks like a leaf actually isn't a leaf, it's a cladode, so that's something to keep an eye out for when you see wattle trees around. Some species of acacia have true leaves, and some species have cladodes. So when we look at the mulga tree, we find that it's branching ever upwards and outwards, ever upwards and outwards from the basic trunk structure. And that's to direct the rainfall down along the branches and to the base of the trunk very much an adaptation for the dry area. So its scientific name is Acacia anura, another wattle, Acacia. So mulga is a very common uh, tree, shrub, through the opal fields. But the opal miners used to say you'll never find opal where there's mulga. Quite different from the wild orange, which they reckon always grows where there is opal. The mulga you won't ever find opal. And in about 19, about the year 2000, out near Grawan, a miner was drilling in an area where he was going to waste his time because it was all mulga trees and he found some of the nicest red opal in the district for a long time. And a huge rush. And what did they call it? The mulga rush. So it's named after this tree and it's a very important field now. It normally just grows on flat, dry ground and that's why the miners thought there's no wild orange or wild lemon or bush passion fruit. The mulga's not. And look, it's another wattle and this one's in flower. Not a spectacular flower, but there's your yellow, yellow wattle flowers. And there's the pod, the fruiting pod from last year, little seed pods. There it is, it fell off, that's last year's. There'll be fresh ones and the seeds all over the ground are sometimes used as bush tucker. The mulga seeds are ground up. So uh, a very important tree on the opal field these days, now that we know you can find opal, where there is the mulga tree. Ever upwards and outwards, remember its branching structure. Very obvious once you know what they look like. Those pale green blue leaves. The graziers find it handy because the livestock will eat it. Cattle are quite happy in a drought time, such that the graziers will actually chainsaw off branches. The tree will regrow and the cattle love eating mulga. And I knew a grazier in this district that said he wore out 16 chainsaw blades, just cutting mulga to keep his cattle and sheep alive. Goats as well will stand right up high and chew the mulga off at head height all the way through. These haven't been chewed, look at them, they're growing all the way down to the ground. A whole, whole forest of mulgas. Quite an interesting place to be because it really forms a complete canopy, so not much grows on the ground at all. If you've ever spent any time at Lightning Ridge or somewhere nearby in the spring, then I know that you can smell this picture. There's a bizarre phenomenon that happens after rain in the cooler months. There will always be this lingering stink in the air. Some say it smells like natural gas, others say it smells like boiled cabbage, some say it actually smells quite pleasant, but most people are pretty bewildered to learn that the smell comes from a tree. To quote Charles Percy Mountford from his 1948 American-Australian scientific expedition to Arnhem Land, Gidget trees might be all right to look at, though to smell them on a damp morning would spoil anyone's breakfast. But Gidget, after a camel has eaten it and the beast has breathed on you, oh hell. Okay, so here we are in the Gidget forest, uh, Acacia cambagii. So another wattle. And it's got the characteristic black, barky trunk. But these are big, serious trees. Very closely similar to the brigolo. A big tree with a dark trunk. And I love these to recognise them as we look. We see the curves in the trunks. They just can't grow straight. 
Wherever we look, the branches, everything are curving, really dark colour. I think the number of stumps around here indicates that the early landholders, this was part of Lawn Station here, much of which in this corner is now taken up for opal mining. Yeah, so the Gidgee tree has a very hard timber and uh, used by the graziers for fence posting or stockyards and also I'd suspect firewood. And we can see evidence here with the cut through stumps, a very large old tree, may have even been one that fell over and died and the, and the branches have been taken off. But that wood you can see is going to last for a long, long time. So there's been some clearing of this area, but even now it's pretty much a closed forest and, and I think it's a beautiful place. It's nice and calm. The little leaves, we can see it's in flower up there. The Gigi is commonly known as stinking wattle. And stinking wattle is because of, in the moist, cool mornings, particularly when it's in flower, there's a, it's not quite an acrid smell, but it's a very characteristic smell for those that live near a Gigi forest. And if the breeze is blowing your way, you will know it. I can just detect it here now even. But when there are flowers on the Gigi, the stinking wattle really earns its name. I'm very much in the camp that Gigi smells like natural gas. In fact, I'm sure that I've rushed in to check that I haven't left the stove on on more than one occasion after an afternoon rainstorm in spring. But as unpleasant as the smell of Gigi may be, it's also a very nostalgic smell that reminds me of growing up in Lightning Ridge, afternoon thunderstorms and times gone by. So those were three different types of acacia, or wattle, that contend with the harsh climate and environment in and around the Lightning Ridge Opal Fields, and one that has a bizarre and immediately recognisable stench. Stay tuned for more bush botany, there's plenty more to come, and I promise you, they won't all stink. This video was made with the help of Warwick Schofield with support from Margaret Schofield and Kay Wotherspoon. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to Curiosity Mine on YouTube and following along on all of the usual social media channels. The links are down in the description. And thank you for watching. I'm being eaten alive by mosquitoes right now.